Thank you, Sylvia. That is a fascinating research indeed. Um, we're going to start with our second session. And the second session will look at trends in South and Southeast Asia, basically looking at ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the Taliban. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Stephen Rod. He's based at the Department of Political and Social Change. He's an expert on local government at decentralization and public opinion polling. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Rod. Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers and for all of you to be here. Um, as you can see, I've got a, a, a bandage on my head. Um, a week ago, I had a bike accident, and I knew I was concussed when I couldn't remember who was the president of the Philippines or the president of the United States. <laughs> when I related this to my daughter back in Manila, she said, oh, a moment of bliss. <laughs> so. As you can tell from the brief introduction, I'm a development professional. For 17 years, I ran the Asia Foundation's country office in the Philippines. And before that, for 18 years, I was an academic at the University of the Philippines. I got into this business because these people came into my space. Um, I was working with the mainstream Islamic forces in the Philippines, Moral National Liberation Front and the Moral Islamic Liberation Front for a number of years, including being in negotiations, et cetera. And then, Beginning in 2014, these people started popping up. All right, so let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, but just as one of the things I'd like to steal an idea of Greg, and, and that is um, noticing that there's been already some things said today that are useful for people like me. Uh, when Dr. Ismail was talking about the sectarian tensions, I was reminded of the fact that for a long time, I thought Philippine Muslims were pretty relaxed about Shia. Um, because they're, they're, of course, majority Sunni. Um, but it turns out that's not the case. Um, ISIS uh, published a list of 11 of the uh, Shia centers in the Philippines, and uh, two have already been uh, taken out. Uh, one was bombed in Manila, and the other one was burned down in Marawi City. Uh, one of the 11, I said to the head, I didn't know you were Shia, and he said, I'm not, they just did that to discredit us with the community, which gives you an idea of the power of that kind of propaganda. Uh, the second point that was came up, and this is what I'd heard from him before, Haroa talked about the different stages of the insurgency. And so when, as the uh, defended territory in Marawi gets smaller and smaller, I was already alerted to the fact that the Islamic State in the Philippines was likely to revert back to more conventional guerrilla warfare, which you can see in the upsurge of uh, violence coming out of the Bangsamoro Islamic Freedom Fighters, somewhat uh, about 150 or 200 kilometers away from Marawi. So there's a, a fair amount of this kind of stuff going back and forth. But for the purposes of this, this conference, uh, information warfare, right, uh, and, and so on. In the Philippines, I'm going to skip right over the partisan information warfare that's ongoing, the fake news, the fake news that the vice president is pregnant and had an abortion or something like that that is going around. Uh, um, and uh, you know, the, never mind, there's lots of fake news in the Philippines. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Basically, as I said, I was working on uh, the peace process with the Moral Islamic Liberation Front and the Moral National Liberation Front. Uh, and then in 2014, when uh, the caliphate was uh, uh, declared, suddenly they became much more active in our areas in central Luzon. A lot of people started uh, pledging Baya, uh, including uh, Hapilon of the Abu Sayyaf and eventually the Maote brothers, the two groups who come together to take over Marawi. Um, but also we became aware of the fact that there was recruiting ongoing in campuses in throughout Southern Philippines. Um, that whether you're talking about madrasas or state universities, there were people going around organizing students. And the reason we became aware is the Asia Foundation gives grants to organizations run by Muslims, which have campus chapters, and there was competition for the good students. Suddenly, if you were articulate or if you were forward-working, instead of being asked to join the book club, 
you were being asked if you wanted to study more about Islam. And if you were told you wanted to study more about Islam, it would be a, a series of, uh, of, of different kind of recruiting techniques. And eventually, you might end in a training camp learning how, in a rural area, to use weapons. Uh, and that happened when there was a raid and uh, the, uh, about eight or 10 young college students who their parents thought had gone off for a, a, a Islamic seminar uh, were killed by the Philippine Marines in a raid. So that sort of thing was going on. Um, now, uh, as uh, this was happening, the Philippine government was in denial. Okay, so uh, our report said uh, they were doing their field work in late 2014. There were more challenges obtaining information on the subject of Daesh radicalization in the Philippines when compared to both Indonesia and Malaysia. While the policymakers and law enfor enforcement officials the author met were professional, cooperative, and helpful, the official position was that Daesh had helped to make its presence, presence felt in the Philippines in a significant manner. They were also of the opinion that Daesh would find it difficult to recruit its citizens. Uh, so I don't know why there's several hundred of them in Marawi City. Right? Um, so uh, they began to, I'm sorry, let's put it, step back a second. The information warfare being indigenously produced in the Philippines didn't change immediately, right? There were still lots of cell phone videos. Basically, the Abu Sayyaf in the province of Sulu would produce what amounts to proof of life videos, where the victim is there and pleading for their life or whatever. But it, you know, and, and sometimes there was an ISIS flag in the background. But, I mean, it, it's kind of a fair judgment of the Philippine security forces that basically what those guys were doing was trying to raise the ransom, was trying to increase the price, right, just by bringing in the brand name of ISIS. Uh, but that's not all that was going on. Uh, there's another branch of the Abu Sayyaf, those in Basilan, those who were headed by the guy Hapilon, who was eventually named Amir, and they have consistently been considerably more Islamic in their approach. And back in 2007 and 2008, they sent a letter, including to the uh, Catholic bishop in the island of Basilan, since about 20% of the people in Basilan are Christian, basically saying that non-Muslims have a choice, right? They can leave, they can fight, they can convert, or they can pay the tax, right? Uh, I call it the Dimmick tax, I think it's called Jirza, right? Uh, the tax that non-Muslims living in an Islamic state. And so, uh, Hapilon has consistently stayed much more true to the original vision of the Abu Sayyaf, which was founded by people who are uh, interested in caliphates, but which had mostly deteriorated due to military pressure killing off all their leaders. And now in Sulu, at least, they're mostly for kidnap for ransom, uh, which is very lucrative, by the way. Uh, this last round, they kidnapped two Canadians, a Norwegian and a Filipina. The Canadians don't pay, and so they were beheaded. The Norwegian pays and the Filipino pays. And so I think they got something on the order of $900,000. Um, which spreads a lot around. But those are normal kinds of kidnap videos. The ISIS type videos started finally coming in early 2016, April 2016, I believe it was. This group, Maute, um, headed by a pair of brothers who were educated in the Middle East uh, and who started calling themselves in 2015 Islamic State in Ranau. Uh, Ranau and Lanau and Barawi, they're all the same word in, in, the, in the language. Um, they are uh, 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 styling themselves more like ISIS, and so when they uh, picked up six Christian sawmill workers, uh, they executed two of them as spies, okay? And they, they did it, they did it right, okay? They had orange jumpsuits and the hands behind them and beheaded on the video and holding up the head and, and so on and so forth. Um, and that was the first one that really had the kinds of troves that you see in ISIS videos. Um, and there have been many more, have not been many more of that, but it's been clearer and clearer, of course, that there is the kind of communication. So if you look on your program, the upper right, 
is from Marawi, right? That's from a video called Inside the Caliphate, uh, number three. Um, and uh, uh, Marawi is there, is either the land of Hijra or Jihad, okay? Um, this goes with the ISIS uh, urging that's been ongoing since the middle of 2016. If you can't get to uh, the Middle East, you can go to Mindanao, you can go to the Philippines, okay? That's a place to go. Um, in that video, if you watch it, there are no beheadings. There are dead bodies, but there's no snuff going on in it. Uh, they, it's clear that those guys in Marawi were using drones with video cameras to provide feeds to ISIS Central. Okay, you can see the kind of shots they're doing. Uh, so this back and forth has been ongoing. And the, uh, uh, recently, uh, last week, they released as a, as a as a single, I don't know how you call these things. Anyhow, the, the nasheed in English that was the background for this video, um, you know, it's holding firm to the rope of Allah are the brothers of Marawi. Engraved in their heart is the love for the Lord and in him they will continue to believe. That kind of thing going on in the nasheed. So it's clear that ISIS Central is, you know, paying attention. But it's not a Wiliyah yet. Okay, because they never really controlled territory, and so they're going to retreat back into the rural areas. All right, so that's the trend of propaganda, media war, jihad in the Philippines. Now, how about the other side? Well, uh, let me put it this way. The easy way to say it is the Philippine government is losing the propaganda war on this one in particular. I mean, aside from just the sheer fact that the full force of the armed forces of the Philippines takes four months to retake a, uh, parts of a city, um, the back and forth has been terrible. So, for instance, three days after he declared martial law, President Rodrigo Duterte revealed on Friday that the Maute group fighting government troops in Marawi City was founded by two brothers, Abdullah and Omar. That part of the sentence is right, okay? <laughs> Who were former police officers involved in illegal drugs. They were policemen in Manila who got enamored of the money of Shabu, methamphetamines. Uh, they came home here and established one of the biggest factories of Shabu in the province, Lanao del Sur. I mean, there's nothing true about that, right? I mean, it's, it's not even vaguely close to true, and it's public knowledge that it's not vaguely close to true. The IPAC of Sidney Jones published a report on these guys in October of 2016, right? Um, so it's really a problem, okay? Uh, but then he goes on to say, Duterte goes on to say, if you, to the, he's making a speech to the military under martial law. If you go down, I go down. But this martial law and the consequences of martial law and the ramifications of martial law, I and I alone would be responsible. Do your job, I will take care of the rest. I'll imprison you myself, he said, and I will go too. But if you had raped three, I admit it, it's on me, okay? This is Duterte talking. He became most famous in Australia talking about raping an Australian missionary. He's talking about raping Muslims in an area where under Marcos martial law back in the 1970s, there was systematic rape, okay? Um, the much nicer military, okay? Um, there was a report, a true report, that all of Marawi is part of a military reservation, okay? Believe me, I've lived in the Philippines 35 years. Property titles are very vague in the Philippines, okay? So it's true, all these people own land, own land, they have titles that is on a military reservation. Now everything's destroyed, what's going to happen? The military assured everybody that they wouldn't take any more land than what they need. Not, you can go back to your house, if you've got a house, you get to keep it, no. They, they were trying to reassure people that they weren't going to be greedy, but the way it came out was terrible. Okay, so first conclusion, yes. First conclusion is, see, not, not bad. First conclusion is that the Philippine government is losing the media war and sometimes seems to not even realize it's in a media war, in a propaganda war. Um, the Maltese do realize. They actually pushed out a video that said to the people of Marawi, why are you mad at us for destroying Marawi? We just came here to free you from the Kafar. It's the Kafar who are destroying Marawi. 
okay? They were saying this in Filipino so that they're reaching out to all the different ethnic groups because that's the common language people have. So they get that they're in a propaganda war, all right? So first point is the propaganda war uh, is, is uh, beyond the ken of the Philippine government. And the second one, and this is a much more general question, I'm wondering if ISIS has changed its tactics, okay, in what it does in the media war. Because after the resorts world attack in Manila, where a crazy guy went in and started a fire and stole uh, chips and then committed suicide, all on continuous video, that's all he did inside, ISIS claimed it, right? There's, there's no evidence whatsoever of this, that he had any connection. A journalist went back over the last 10 days of his life, there's no evidence whatsoever of any connection. And yet, and yet, some people, including Sidney Jones, basically said there must be something because ISIS never claims anything that there's no connection, all right? Now we've got Las Vegas, right? There's no evidence whatsoever. I mean, this guy had this girlfriend living with him until the last week of his life, and he sent her away. He was obviously planning to do it. There's no evidence whatsoever of a connection with ISIS, and ISIS claimed it. Okay, so I raise that as a question, not for poor Philippine experts such as myself, but of the broader experts who look on S ISIS. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rod, for a great presentation, for making my work not difficult at all, especially, you know, it's very hard to be a militant timekeeper. Um, well, our next speaker is Mr. Niamatullah Ibrahimi. Um, he is an Endeavor Award holder and a PhD scholar. Um, he co-founded Afghanistan Watch, a research organization focusing on human rights and conflict settlement in Afghanistan. And he also worked for the International Crisis Group. Um, I would like to welcome him and please join me in welcoming Mr. Ibrahimi. Uh, thank you, Raihana. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak uh, this wonderful conference on this very, very lively and interesting topic. Um, uh, over the next 10, 15 minutes, I will focus on uh, insurgent propaganda and informational uncertainty in Afghanistan, and, and I'm primarily focusing on the Taliban. Uh, I thought maybe I can start by telling the story of a short conversation once I had with a former Taliban official in Kabul who used to work with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs under Wakil Ahmad Mutawakil um, after they took control of Kabul in 1996. And in one of the stories he told me is quite relevant to the themes of the conference. That is, after 1997, when the Taliban took control of large swaths of northern Afghanistan. He said that you know, a group of us, younger, you know, more professional diplomats, you know, organized a, a meeting at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, raising the issue with the minister at that time, who was Rakil Ahmad Mutawakil, that since the Taliban approaching the borders of Central Asia, we should issue a statement to assure Central Asian republics that we are not posing and the security threats to the, you know, the territorial integrity and security of the Central Asian republics. In response, uh, Wakil Ahmad Mutawakil had answer, raised another question. You know, do we really mean it? <laughs> Once we take control of Afghanistan and we consolidate our rule here, we might just go across the border. And why should we tell a lie? So the main point I'm trying to communicate here is this whole idea of Taliban propaganda, their sincerity and honesty, and how they try to communicate to different audiences. And the central theme is um, the idea of uh, uncertainty. You know, uncertainty is you know, an important part of everyday life everywhere, 
But in countries which are torn by war and conflict, you know, like Afghanistan for more than, for nearly four decades now, you know, uncertainty is you know, a very, very important part of life on a day-to-day basis. And this affects how people you know, make their decisions you know, for themselves, for their kids, and for the future of their children. Uh, and obviously, there are a lot of hard decisions to be made. And I will explore that a little bit later with some data which I use from the Asia Foundation Survey of the Afghan People. Um, what I'm presenting is, you know, based, you know, uh, you know, as I grew up in Afghanistan, but also as a researcher working for the International Crisis Group, looking at different aspects of the Taliban insurgency after they began from, uh, you know, after a few years of Taliban collapse between 2001 and 2004 and five. Um, so what we are witnessing in comparison to 1998 is that there is this boom of Taliban propaganda. There is propaganda campaign, where, you know, which a lot of people think is telling something new about the movement, about their ideology, and about their aims. <clears throat> you know, some people think you know, the Taliban who were in the 1990s against you know, taking a photograph are now so effectively using social media means that there is a new type of Taliban emerging, you know, the new Taliban who are you know, more, smarter but also more modern. And for some people that also means more reconcilable because they have been exposed to uh, you know, modern aspects of life. And some people even claim that there is a Taliban kind of virtual caliphate emerging. You know, this is about a group which in the 1990s even would not you know, let you know, someone take a picture of them. Uh, but in their information campaign, the Taliban have been uh, also facing the challenge of how to communicate to different audiences. Uh, and I think three different audiences is key to understanding how the Taliban develop, formulate, and communicate their messages. The first and primary is um, the people in Afghanistan, and this is you know, the area where they operate, and this is an area where they uh, rely on the support networks. Uh, you know, they can mobilize and can organize in the cities, villages, and, and, and towns of the country. And the second uh, prim primary audience, um, I believe, is the international jihadist network, which is loosely connected to the international Salafi jihadists that you mentioned, which comes with certain you know, theological tendencies, with certain political views, um, and they have got the money and the resources, and of which the Taliban have not been keen to ignore. <clears throat> and the third in, in, uh, audience is more international. You know, people who are engaged in the strategic environment in Afghanistan, you know, obviously, including the US and NATO, you know, you know, other countries in the region. So these three different narratives that the Taliban have been communicating to these three different groups have also been conflicting, contradictory, but not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, maybe I begin by you know, making a couple of remarks about how they communicate to the international audience. You know, one of the key things is that they have been emphasizing that they are a nationalist movement. Their ambitions are restricted to Afghanistan. You know, which, as I said earlier, there is this deep international contradictions within the movement, whether it is genuinely you know, a nationalist movement or not. And a lot of people have been trying to buy into that narrative. In particular, people have been interested in the idea of a potential settlement uh, and, and peaceful reconciliation with the Taliban because if they are a nationalist movement limited to Afghanistan, you know, they are not posing any security threat to the West or other countries in the region. However, the Taliban are also, their narrative of communication are also shaped by their uh, fact that they are embedded in, in, in a transnational network of jihadi Salafists. You know, it is through here that they mobilize recruits, it is through here that they 
uh, mobilize resources, money and arms. Um, and these are like powerful networks. The, the most uh, powerful example of this is obviously the Al-Qaeda. But more recently, I have been witnessing that after the arrival of the ISIS or Daesh in Afghanistan after 2014, there have been this competition between the two groups. Um, the Taliban initially trying to you know, approach them and you know, talk to them, um, but uh, on the long-term basis, um, they have been, uh, after there was this conflict of interest and control of territories and resources, they have been going back to this whole idea of that we are a national movement and the Taliban, the ISIS are terrorists and they are internationalists. Uh, for the Afghan audience, the Taliban have been very, very uh, selectively using imagery, symbols of Afghanistan's national history. That includes um, the history of the Afghan, Ang Anglo Afghan wars in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So, uh, in this respect, I had the opportunity to work with a research uh, project in 2015, which did look at the role of Taliban communication and social media and how they recruit uh, uh, um, th their members. Uh, in this respect, the Taliban were very, very keen that they were part of this kind of con historical con uh, continuity, uh, you know, which began you know, at least in the 19th century, this kuffars and the colonialists, they emerged in Afghanistan and they had this you know, malign intention for the country and they were you know, uh, drawing on the imageries of the uh, of the 19th century and early 20th century Afghanistan. However, there are also like conflicting reports here. You know, they, when they pose themselves as a national force, you know, Afghanistan is also in a highly diverse country, both ethnically but also um, religiously. You know, the Hazaras, you know, predominantly Shias, you know, have been the primary victims of the Taliban um, uh, atrocities since the 1990s. And they have been uh, you know, keen to emphasize that aspect of it, that we are a national force, we are all brothers, you know, we have nothing in conflict in, in between us. But at the same time, you know, because of that international connection, because of that kind of ideological, theological influences which come through the Taliban's embedded nature in the international network of jihadists, you know, sectarian violence, you know, you know appear quite frequently uh, and can be directly attributed to the Taliban. Uh, maybe in the last five minutes, uh, I would like to show a few slides. Um, and this, in these slides, you know, the key thing I would like to show is the idea of uncertainty. You know, as I said, uncertainty is common, but in Afghanistan, you know, this graph shows the, the fluctuation in the economic uh, growth in Afghanistan, which began from, you know, 8.4 in 2003, reaching to 21% in 2009, before collapsing, you know, to 1.3 in 2004 and 0 0.8 in 2015. And, you know, the main message I'd like to, do, you know, deliver here is when they communicate to the a national audience, like, uh, you know, those in Afghanistan, you know, people have this very, very uncertain prospects. You know, this is like just one indication of how in the political security and economic conditions can be changing so rapidly. You know, with every one of those changes, people lose jobs, they lose access to you know, social and economic opportunities, and also obviously security as well. But given all these talks that the Taliban are effective in their media campaign, um, what is emerging, you know, here I'm drawing on the Asia Foundation survey of the Afghan people, which they have been conducting since 2006. Uh, you know, the main thing which is emerging here is that the common people in that country, you know, they are neither won over by the Afghan government nor by the Taliban in their, in, their, uh, in their information campaign. So one of the questions they ask is, you know, generally speaking, what do you, you know, do you think the country is going in the right direction? The positive answer for that um, right direction, you know, changed from 44% in 2006 to 
just 29% in 2016. And 66% of the people in 2016 thought the country is going in the, right, in the wrong direction. And one of the other questions I asked in that survey is gauging the level of sympathy for the armed opposition groups. You know, they asked, would you say that you have a lot of sympathy, little sympathy, or no sympathy at all for the armed opposition groups? As you can see, uh, people who had lots of sympathy, you know, they uh, declined from 22% in 2009 to just 5% in 2016. And people who had no sympathy at all increased from 34% in 2009 to 77% in 2016. So what this is showing is that in the common people are not persuaded by the Taliban propaganda campaign. And this is very, very interesting because you know, during this period when um, the people's sympathy declined for the Taliban, their reach has expanded. According to uh, US officials, including the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan, the construction, the Taliban, as of last year, control or have, or influence over 40% of the, you know, the territory of the country. Okay, sure, I'll answer some periods. And that means um, that as the Taliban, were like you know, a smaller, more distant force, inaccessible, um, and they, people could hear their you know, messages, and you know, people had higher sympathy, but as the Taliban got closer to them again, controlling their villages, you know, imposing their harsh way of life, you know, in villages, cities, in, 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 in from, from province to provinces, that level of support has been declining. And unfortunately, as we can see, that same level of support has not been going up for the Afghan government uh, as well. And this means that there is an information war going on here, but that information war, you know, looking at the level of support of the ordinary people in Afghanistan is not being won by either side. So this is whole, you know, level of you know, uncertainty, you know, which has been going on for years and years and years. Um, and one of the uh, you know, interesting observations you know, which I came up in my PhD, but also in other research is that people are just trying to weigh up their options. Um, and one of those ways is that you, um, you know, instead of committing ideologically, making normative commitment to a group, people are you know, ensuring their survival through creation and maintenance of multiple linkages with different groups. Because when the Taliban are in control of a province, you don't want to be a, a person who has been seen as, you know, as anti-Taliban you know, sometimes in the past. Okay, so with that note, I'll stop here and look forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you, Mr. Brahimi. Our final speaker today for this session is uh, Associate Professor Greg Healy. He is the head of the Department of Political and Social Change. He works on Indonesia, um, especially looking at Muslim the Muslim traditionalist uh, party, Nahdlatul Ulama. Um, and more recently, he has examined terrorism, um, transnational Islamist movements, and religious commodification in Australia, which is fascinating. Um, and also looking at the broader trends in contemporary Islamic politics in Southeast Asia. Please well, join me in welcoming um, Greg. Thank you very much, Raihan. Um, so what I'm going to do is, in a way, um, give a slightly broader picture than what Steve um, gave, if you're concentrating um, uh, closely on the Philippines, but many of the themes are actually going to be common, I think, to, to both of our papers. Um, and 
Indeed, several speakers have mentioned um, some of the Inside the Caliphate videos that are released by the Al Hayat Media Centre from one of the official um, ISIS um, media officers. Uh, I would like to be able to show some of these um, to you, and Steve referred to this particular one, is a video that uses the, um, the drone footage, very high production values, as we've come to expect for an ISIS um, video. But unfortunately, the university's um, uh, information commons technology blocks us from showing this. You can show it in your home, you can add, download it from the Jihadology website, which does a great service to researchers by making this material available, but you cannot play this on, on any of the um, uh, computers in public lecture theatres uh, like this. So I have to make do with just a photo. So inside the Caliphate, number three, which came out several months ago, and then a few weeks ago we had inside the Caliphate um, number four, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the contrast between them um, a little later on. Um, also, the cover of the Rumaya, the latest edition of the Rumaya, Rome uh, magazine, um, which for the first time ever has Southeast Asia, well, this is calling it East Asia, but it's really Southeast Asia, on the cover. Um, much sought after status by um, pro ISIS groups in the region, and um, they have finally achieved that. This edition came out perhaps five weeks ago, six weeks ago. Um, it contains, it's all in very good English, and uh, as we've come to expect, a very high quality um, uh, imagery and the like used. Um, so, this is a story of a Malaysian jihadist who's gone and joined the fighters. Um, in, um, in the Philippines. Uh, we also have a kind of a, a centrefold, as it were, of the, of the leader, the Emir of ISIS forces in Southeast Asia, uh, Isnilon Hapilon, that um, Steve referred to um, just before. Uh, quite a long interview with him. Um, so there he is, the man in the middle with the kapaya around his, his head. Um, and this is only, I think it's about a six page interview, so it's quite extensive material. So, in ISIS's world, this is star status. This is enjoying time in the spotlight. And uh, what this brings to my mind, having been involved in um, the study of Southeast Asian terrorism for some time, is uh, recollections of when Southeast Asia was regarded as the second front in the global war on terrorism. So, if we go back to 2002, for example, Colin Powell was one of various um, Bush administration officials who used this term of the second front, and it really marked the first time in a great many, well, really since the Cold War, that America had had much interest in Southeast Asia at all. And so, we got a whole string of articles about is Southeast Asia the second front. Um, we've got a lot of in US institutions employing Southeast Asianists to study this. And um, we even had, oops, is that going to go down? Uh, where is that? Okay. And we even got books on, on this kind of second front. So it's not just that the Western world is now again paying attention to Southeast Asia in a jihadism context, um, but also that ISIS itself is. So, um, just to give us slightly um, a quick wrap up of how I see ISIS's impact on Southeast Asian jihadism, it has been immense, but not as great as some terrorist analysts um, would assert. And indeed, before the Marawi battle broke out on, when was it, 23rd of May uh, this year, you would have to argue that ISIS has had much greater potential to change the dynamics of terrorism rather than actually having realised that. Um, because although there are a great many plots across Southeast Asia that were being hatched in the name of ISIS, none of them had been successful as terrorism attacks. So therefore you could see people with the will to engage in this kind of violence but not, lacking, not having the technical capacity to do so. Um, one of the first things that ISIS did, the creation of ISIS, and particularly as um, more and more South, prominent Southeast Asian jihadists 
pledged allegiance to it was it divided the jihadist community. And insofar as we can get a sense of what this community is, and by that we really mean people who consume the website material, buy the books, attend lectures um, given by preachers who have got well-known pro-ISIS um, orientations, the majority of jihadist or anti-ISIS orientations would be another way of putting it, the majority of those people opposed ISIS. Even though recruitment towards ISIS's cause grew rapidly from early 2014, um, nonetheless, the majority remain opposed. Um, the largest number of pro-ISIS groups can really be found in Indonesia. We're probably looking at several thousand. I mean, this is no clearly defined uh, group of people. It's got very blurry boundaries to it. Um, but if we look at data on how many people are donating money, how many people are helping to organise the passage, for example, of fighters from a place like Indonesia to Syria and Iraq or to the Philippines, there's, there's quite broad networks that have some kind of um, participation in this. Um, the Philippines, Stephen's already spoken about, and the Philippines is the only place in Southeast Asia where we see any significant military capacity. And that's one of the reasons why um, this honour, as it were, was bestowed upon the head of a Filipino jihadist leader, it's Nilan Hapilon, one of the commanders of Abu Sayyaf Group, rather than an Indonesian. And Indonesia has traditionally seen itself as the focus of jihadism in the region. Um, we have a smaller number of Malaysians involved as well, a couple of them, particularly Dr Mahmoud Ahmad, playing an increasingly critical role in liaising between central ISIS and its operatives um, in the region. Um, the main... Um, the main issue for us, and so I suppose my, my view would be that um, the terrorism threat across most of Southeast Asia remains significantly lower now than what it was in the early 2000s when Jema Islamiyah was at its height because most ISIS groups simply do not have the capability to put together large bombs or to mount more complex covert operations which would lead to mass casualties. Um, people want to do it, but they simply cannot get the necessary skills off the internet and too many of the people with skills in bomb making who are able to pass that on to emerging jihadists have either been killed or are incarcerated <coughs> or have left jihadism as well. And so um, the thing that could make a dramatic change here it would be the return of experienced fighters, especially from Syria and Iraq, and the number of those coming back is actually still very small. Great many of them appear much more willing to die on the battlefield in the Middle East than they are to return here. And there are eschatological reasons for that, which I'm happy to go into later if people are interested. Um, but now, increasingly, the Philippines is looking as almost performing the kind of role that Afghanistan did from about 1985 to the early 1990s, in that this is where people were, to some extent, blooded in battle, uh, even though the majority of Southeast Asian Mujahideen didn't see um, uh, uh, fighting, they nonetheless got the skills, they got the discipline, they got the international connections and the ideological training that equipped them for um, a much higher level of, of violent jihadism when they returned um, home. Um, so a good example of one of these um, Failed ISIS attacks was the, this is from the so-called Serena attack in central Jakarta in January of 2016 where there were four um, pro-ISIS perpetrators with homemade grenades, bombs, guns uh, and they only, well I should say, their intention was to copy the Paris attack. So they wanted to kill dozens of people, they especially wanted to kill police and Westerners. Um, they did kill one person who was um, uh, of Western descent, if I can put it that way, who happened to be, in fact, a Muslim. All of the people killed in the attack were Muslims. No police were killed, the total of seven, um, including the four perpetrators, all of whom died. So, in ISIS terms, and indeed in local jihadist terms, this was a bungled operation. Um, the fact that it was clearly modelling itself on a major terrorism attack of, abroad and had not achieved any of its objectives um, just showed that for many local jihadists, 
it showed how embarrassingly poor their ability, ability was to bring off a major attack. And you can see around them there were hundreds if not thousands of people in this place um, and um, very low casualty rate came out of that. Um, so if we're looking specifically at the, in, in the information wars, most jihadist recruitment in Southeast Asia is still done face to face. There's a growing role for uh, online uh, propaganda campaigns and the like, but from the, the biographical information we have from people involved in, in pro-ISIS networks, still it is that personal connections. It's a charismatic preacher, it's a family member, it's a friend, um, colleagues at school or the work. These are the ways in which people are getting pulled into um, jihadist organisations. Um, one of the things we're seeing when we look at um, the, um, the types of people being recruited is their enormous diversity. Some of them come from jihadist families that have now their third or fourth genera generation pedigree. People who've been involved in other organisations such as Jamal Islamiyah or Darul Islam are now pledged members of ISIS. We also have high school kids who come from families that are unobservant Muslims and who have been recruited largely through online activities. So it really spans an enormous spectrum of people, far wider than any previous phase of jihadist recruitment in Southeast Asia. Um, ISIS, not surprisingly, is really the leader of this kind of propaganda, online propaganda wars um, in Southeast Asia. And uh, it's interesting to look at um, the way in which this messaging had changed. Up until late 2015, most of what ISIS was trying to do was persuade Southeast Asians to go to Syria and Iraq. That was the main site, they believed, of jihadist struggle in the world. This was going to be where the end of time would take place, this final cataclysmic battle between Islam and its enemies. And those people who were fighting on the right side would be vouchsafed um, salvation. So this is why probably some there in the order of a thousand Southeast Asians went and joined the fighting in um, Syria and Iraq. A great many hundred of them have died, some of them as cannon fodder uh, in that. Since late 2015, we've seen some of the prominent Southeast Asians in ISIS Central using their networks back in their home countries to argue for operations in those home countries. So attack on your own soil rather than going to Syria. And then in the last few months, we've seen a further swing in ISIS rhetoric, which is telling people don't come to Syria, go to Philippines in particular, or wage your jihad in your own country. And so, um, two minutes, yeah. Uh, so um, that's been quite a, a marked shift. Um, the, the content ranges from the very visceral sorts of images that we have in that Inside the Caliphate 3 video that I put the photo of, uh, showed the photo of beforehand. And this shows people in the thick of battle, firing you know, machine guns, covered in dust and grime, sometimes with their feet on the bodies of dead Filipino soldiers. It shows them desecrating Christian churches. Um, it's very graphic footage. It's very well shot, including the use of um, uh, drones and the like. Um, but we also have images that we see in inside the caliphate at all, uh, as well, which has no blood in it, that has no dead bodies. It has a relatively clean cut, quite articulate Singaporean um, uh, fighter who it calls, um, they call uh, Abu Kail, but in actual fact is this man Shahdan bin Abdul Samad, who left Singapore in 2014 to go to the Middle East. He told family he was going there to work, but he's clearly become a recruit. Um, and uh, there's a number of things in the uh, video that are interesting, but it's a different kind of appeal to the appeal that you would find for Caliphate, inside the Caliphate number three. That presumably is appealing to people who have much greater sense of machismo, sense of adventure or daring do, and um, people who want to see the sheer violence of the battle, that is clearly depicted in that Inside the Caliphate Three, which has Southeast Asians from various countries um, shown in that. Also of interest to me is the range of 
intellectual content. So some of the material is very superficial. It's relying on particular images and there's not much um, ideological or historical content to it at all. It's very simple branding. But there is also a high-end, uh, more erudite kind of discourse that ISIS engages in. And in uh, Indonesia, the key person for this, person who has influence beyond Indonesia's borders, is Aman, Aman Abdurrahman, who's really the chief ideologue for ISIS, um, a brilliant um, uh, propagandist himself, a superb Arabic language skills, able to translate within very short space of time major ISIS texts and get them onto Indonesian social media. He's in maximum security um, confinement, jail in Indonesia, um, but that doesn't stop him from getting his messages out. Uh, and so you can see the different levels in which ISIS is working at. Um, one of the things ISIS has done in the last few months is enforce a kind of ideological conformity. There is really quite a broad range of views. And Southeast Asia traditionally has, has been a place of derivative jihadist thinking. There's been a lot of reproduction of views and concepts that have come from particularly the Middle East to a lesser extent South Asia. Um, and, but in the last few months we've seen people like Aman Abdurrahman who have had views that are not exactly consonant with that of ISIS, and he's been forced to repent twice, in fact, in public, for stepping out of line from the official uh, views. So this is one way in which social media is being used to try to get some alignment um, with the official ISIS message. The anti-ISIS info wars, and this is really um, uh, my final slide, this is really going from... Um, what, or second last slide, from what Steve was saying. Regional governments, I think, have largely failed in their social media messaging against ISIS. Uh, and it's usually political or doctrinal factors that lie at the heart of this. In many countries, the emphasis governments decide, indeed very much as the Australian government and lots of other governments decide, the emphasis is upon moderate Islam. And the problem is that moderate so-called Islamic leaders have almost no traction amongst radicalising communities. Governments are doing this because it's less politically risky for them or it's more congenial for their own orientation. Singapore has the same issue again. They could be using Salafist preachers who are non-violent, who use a language that's quite similar to what the jihadists use, but that goes against other tenets that they hold Dear, and so they don't want to be seen to be empowering highly, con highly conservative um, voices. So therefore, they miss out on an opportunity to, ha to have the most effective possible campaigns. Um, a lot of the, and we can see similar things in Malaysia, we had these sham things such as a global moderate Muslim movement that Najib um, leads in Malaysia, but domestically he's engaged in a highly sectarian campaign that's raised religious tensions considerably. So a lot of the online de-radicalisation efforts are also very poorly informed. There's often a dearth of really high quality research about what factors are critical in radicalising young Muslims. And these campaigns are just taking stabs in the dark at what might work. Again, often driven by moderate messages rather than things that are going to be really attuned to the people most at risk. And there's consistently, okay, last a uh, few comments. And there's consistently this um, uh, denial of the opportunities to Salafist groups to have an effect. But we know just looking at what the jihadists are saying online, they're responding to Salafist criticism as much as anything. That's a thing that really upsets them very often. Um, and Steve has spoken about most of these issues, but Harara before talked about propaganda traps. And the Malta brothers really seemed to have a strategic trap for the Philippines government in Marawi, which was encourage it, draw it into excessive action, which would become a propaganda opportunity for, the, for them. And that's exactly what they did by aerial bombing Marawi, by so extensively destroying the city. And that's created an enormous amount of grievance among uh, the evacuees from Marawi. There are concerns that when the city is rebuilt, it will, become, it will be more Christianised than what it was beforehand. All of these things are handing material to ISIS. And so we only need to look at these kinds of activities that regional governments are doing to realise that 
why they're so comprehensively losing the information wars. Thank you. painted an increased threat environment in the Philippines and Southeast Asia more broadly. And um, given that Australia tends to view terrorism from an immediately Southeast Asian lens first, um, I was wondering if I could get a little bit from the two of you about what, the li what you think the likelihood of that increased threat pushing directly towards Australia or Australian interests and how much it orientates more towards local, uh, local problems and local challenges. Well, I mean, one of the things that is, is somewhat obvious is the extent to which there are a lot of Australian citizens in the, in the Philippines that who are uh, very vulnerable. Uh, they tend to be on uh, uh, beach resorts, which are reachable by the Abu Sayyaf and, and so on and so forth. And, and we know how much trouble it's one single kidnapped Australian can cause for the Australian government. But more generally, I think that the ability of the uh, jihadis to take and hold territory and, you know, hold territory that is getting direct assistance from Australia and direct assistance from the United States. Right. I mean, they've won an enormous propaganda victory, and it's going to take a long time for that to start fading away. Uh, and and they are they're reacting, I, you know, you can't kill an idea by killing lots of people, and we're killing, they've killed some 800 of them, but they're already reacting tactically. So the same sort of thing is going to continue. Uh, now, uh, in some sense, you know, there's the, the real question of in the short term, I mean, what are you going to worry about? North Korea with its atomic bombs or, or, uh, or the jihadis? And I worry about North Korea. But I live in the Philippines, and I worry much more about the violent extremists than I do about North Korea. Yes, and I haven't got a lot to add to that. Uh, I don't think there's a great risk, one can never entirely rule it out, but I don't think there's a great risk of some of the people who may have been trained in the Philippines or even in places in Indonesia coming to Australia for an operation. I think that's just too difficult. The risk factors are too great. And one of the things we know about terrorists is that they're reasonably pragmatic when it comes to those kinds of things. But as Steve was saying, the real risk is for Australians in the region. We have about a million Australians a year who go to Bali on holidays. Um, Bali is a far harder terrorist um, site now, uh, or site for terrorist operations than it was um, back in 2005, the last attack. But nonetheless, you would have to say that that's probably places like that, possibly even Phuket or other places in Indonesia where terrorists, where, where tourists congregate, that they would be um, fairly um, high risk areas. So I think that's, it's Australians in the region rather than Australians on home soil who are likely to be um, targets of that. I do, I'm still yet to be convinced by the arguments for why Australia should be having those Orion aircraft doing the surveillance in the Philippines, uh, because I imagine that the US must already have had really extensive intelligence assistance to, um, uh, it was done, so we are shown to have a role in the region, uh, and that may not necessarily be a bad thing, but it also means that for ISIS, it looks like it's a crusade, it's part of this, this centuries old, Christian crusade against Muslim countries, the more countries like Australia get involved in that, even if in a small way, the more in which that is playing into the propaganda war of ISIS. So I just wonder if the benefits that come from that actually are likely to outweigh the potential um, uh, deleterious effects.
I, I would say that everything I hear is that uh, the government of Bangladesh is precisely where the government of the Philippines was back in 2012, 2013, in utter denial. And so I think that increases the risk all by itself. Uh, and I think among people who study this, people like Andrew Self, who's at, um, uh, you know, formerly of the ANU, uh, have a scepticism. In the past, in the, in the kind of... Um, uh, in the early 2000s, we know that there were Rohingya organisations, uh, Arno was one of them, which attended a regional um, meeting of jihadist organisations that Jemmy Islamia convened. Um, but it's not clear that they knew exactly what the purpose was. I think they might have only attended once of the, of the three meetings. But nonetheless, this kind of information was used by, shall I call them, the alarmist terrorist scholars. Um, who are always looking to ramp up a threat, um, not always in a balanced way, but they use this to say, see, regional jihadism is now spreading to Western Myanmar and into Bangladesh. There are also reports of the Rohingya that worked with um, uh, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. A lot of that material, and there are Al-Qaeda links into the Rohingya um, refugee communities. I've seen very little evidence, strong evidence in the public domain for that. There are a few journalists who have peddled this line, but a lot of it is, comes down to hearsay or information from regional intelligence agencies that haven't provided any documentation to really prove the case. So I think we have to be careful. Um, for one, uh, the Myanmar government is, they don't refer to them as Rohingya, they refer to them as Bengali terrorists. And the more in which the international community, the international media uses the word terrorism to describe this ARSA, ARSA group that, that attacked these police posts, um, the more it actually plays into that um, narrative and deflects some of the pressure on Myanmar government to stop the exodus. So that would be my fear. 